repeat the non-conformist oath. I promise to be different. I promise to be different. I promise to be unique. I promise to be unique. I promise not to repeat things other people say. Welcome back to Positive Blatherings, a show about positivity. I bring on guests who I feel uh, bring, you know, have a, have a positive effect on the world. And there's no prep involved. I go in, we sit down, we have a conversation, and we see where the conversation goes to. Let me just remind you about Legacy Casts. Legacy Cast is a product that we have here at Rockbox Recording and Production where you bring in your father, your grandfather, your grandmother, aunts and uncles, anybody that you want to record their stories, sit down in our nice studio and talk about their lives. And it's for posterity. So you can do as many hours as you want. Lots of hours because you can't really <laughs> sum up somebody's uh, full life, right? In just an hour or two, but it's legacy cast. You can find out more at rockvox.com or your legacy cast.com. Today's guest is a very special person. I know, I know I've known this man for, I, I think it's been, 12 years because I, I first started going to Mountain Rise United Church of Christ in 2012. And my guest today is David Aykroyd, the newscaster of Mountain Rise. Um, you're, you're the one that, that keeps everybody up to date on what's going on. You come up in the, during the worship service and tell everyone what's going on in the church. And hope that I've got it correct. And hope that you have it correct. <laughs> and, so, and sometimes you don't. And they're free to correct me and they do. from the audience and they do <laughs> and they absolutely do so um but you're you're also the greeter you you stand at the door every sunday and open up the door for for people as they come in yeah and little background on that that's just something that evolved scott oh really when we were doing the major renovations at mountain rise and we had Everything piled in the center of the sanctuary, it was called uh, McFadden's Mountain. We were relocated to the Parenton Community Center. And I just thought it was nice to, because multiple groups were coming in on Sunday mornings. Mm -hmm. So I figured somebody should be at the door to tell them where the Mountain Rise group is. So that's how this greeter concept started i just happened to be opening the door and saying good morning to people and telling them which room we were in uh and it just continues and uh the commentary that occasionally filters down to me uh, from people who have since joined the church was one of the things they liked most was being greeted by someone and somebody that knew their name if they came back a second time. So it's, it's just something that evolved, and I love doing it, uh, getting high fives from little ones coming in and just uh, making people feel welcome. So yeah. that's that's what I do. That's what you do. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, so in, in 2010, I was seeking some sort of spiritual something. And I visited, I, I grew up Catholic, so I wasn't going that route again. Um, it's just, I just never, it's too much work to be Catholic in my, in my opinion, <laughs> right? Um, so I was looking for something that was non-denominational, but I also didn't want to have Jesus shoved down my throat. I wanted some, I wanted a place where I could go and, and worship in my own way and be with people who are of like mind and like philosophies. And I happened upon Mountain Rise and you were the first person that I saw walking <laughs> up. And you opened the door and you're like, you started talking to me and you 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 know told me where to go and all this kind of stuff. And and you know, there there was a period, there was a couple of years where I stopped going to church for my own reasons. Um but I always, you know, every once in a while, I'd pop back, and the, and the pastor at the time, Greg, uh, Reverend Doctor Greg Osterberg, who I've become quite close with uh, over the years, um, I sat down and spoke with him, and found out he played guitar, and we had a lot in common. So that was, you know, the other thing. But you were you were the first person, and I have to tell you that that is that was a huge factor for me. 
um, because I went to, there's a church off Winton, the Unitarian Church, um, which is very similar to Mountain Rise in how people are there and the welcoming, you know, congregation. Um, but there was something just a little cozier and a little nicer about Mountain Rise. That and it's, you know, right around the corner from my house. That <laughs> Well, that convenience is, is, is a very positive factor. It is. Uh, my wife and I and our family, we joined there in the mid-70s. So I'm coming up wow. to 50 years of worshiping at Mountain Rise. Wow. And I, 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 there's a story I tell, and when we do the Discover More sessions for folks that want to learn more about us as a faith community, uh, the first Sunday we came in and sat in the church, and all of a sudden the, we got to the sermon, and the sermon was Reverend Carl Johnson uh, Preaching and he played the Coca Cola theme song. I'd like to teach the world to sing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then what did we have to do? We had to break up into small groups of three to five people and discuss what the what this song meant to us. And I said, "What kind of a church is this?" <laughs> and, and we've been there ever since. Yeah. Uh, and it's just it's a delight. From my perspective, I just I enjoy going there, and we've gone through. We had the Reverend Carl Johnson, then we had intentional interims, and then we had uh, Rick Ware, and then we had intentional interims, and then we had Reverend Doctor Greg Osterberg, and now we're in the same process. Greg gave us seven, seventeen to eighteen years of inspired leadership, and. Uh, so now we're we're still there. All these preachers <laughs> have left, and uh, we just wait to see who comes next. I think it's a it's amazing that you've been going there since the 1970s, and I only say that because I've moved around so much. When I was a kid, we had there was one Catholic church that we went to, St. David's, in in Davie, Florida, but then. After after high school, I moved around so much, and then church didn't really wasn't really part of my my life, and it was only you know recently that that it has become so, and only because I found the right community to to be with because I don't like I don't like feeling pressured in <laughs> in the religious space, you know, and that's that's the one thing that I really love about Mountain Rise is that it's not and and it just so happened that I had the right skill set to. <laughs> <laughs> to join the church is yeah. that was the first thing I wanted to do is like, ooh, can I help with your audio? Can I help with your video? That's cool. Yeah. So and that's you know, a little background. I I grew up in the UCC or pre UCC. I started at Salem in Salem Church in the city, which was evangelical and reformed, and before that it was a German evangelical. Oh, and I can vaguely recall them having sermons, one in German and then one in English every Sunday. Uh, and my dad and mom were born there, baptized there, married there, confirmed there. All They went through the whole thing. Uh, I had my mother as a piano player in my Sunday school class. My father was my Sunday school teacher. Uh, my wife and I, I got Married there, confirmed there, baptized there, and uh, then we moved to Fairport and uh, continued for about a year tra traveling into the city. And then I said, I just want to start looking around, and that's how we stumbled on Mountain Rise. And uh, as I say, we've been there ever since. So that's our faith community. That's that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> So what was your, what line of work? Because I'm just, this the, the reason why I invited you, because I wanted to learn more about what made you the kind of person that you are. So uh, clearly you've defined that, that you grew up in the church. Your parents were very active in the church. You were very active in the church. So, and I, and I do have uh, an idea that people who grew up in, in and around religion 
you can go one of you can really go one of two ways. You can go the the helper way or you can go the fanatic way. And I you're the helper. You're the helper, you're the nice guy, the smiler and and that was why I wanted to find out what what have you done in your life and 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 how much that has you know sort of crafted yeah. the, who you are. It, it's interesting. Uh if you know, I grew up in the city. I, I, I can recall in the 1940s when mom and dad didn't have two nickels to rub together, but they had to go to church. And if mom wasn't up to it, dad and I would at times walk. Now, we lived in a little section of the city called Swilburg. Oh, yeah. And so it was a pretty good hike from Swilburg to Salem Church. And where's uh, Salem Church? That was uh, on Bittner Street. It was right near the YWCA. Oh, okay. Uh, there used to be an accident prevention bureau for the city police department right across the street That's from the church. It's over by Andrews, and, and, right? Yeah. 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 So walking to church— it, yeah, that's a good Didn't hike. It was a very good hike. And that's before 490 split that whole there thing up, There was right? no 490. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, it came time. Uh, we moved from our first house on Benton Street. Now, this house was old when my dad and mom bought it in uh, 1944. A uh, couple of Unusual features, if you wanted to go to the basement, you had to either go out and lift up what I would call the Bilco doors that you could in yeah. the basement. Or if you wanted to do it from inside, there was a trap door in the kitchen floor. <laughs> and you could <laughs> then go down to the basement. Um, I, my dad tried making homemade wine once in, in that basement. Uh, he got up one morning to find that the barrels had sprung a leak, and so he had probably, I don't know, 50 gallons or so of, of Concord grape wine juice on the <laughs> dirt floor, and it, it just soaked right in. And that was the last time he tried to make grape juice into wine. Uh, and then we moved to East Arundacoit in 1950, December of 1950, and that was uh, my dad's dream was to live in the suburbs, and we were there. I had to go to high school in the city. I had to go to Ben Franklin High School because East Arundacoit at that time did not have a high school. They had three uh, elementary school districts, and then my dad was involved in the consolidation and the drive that led to the building of Eastridge High School. Hmm. But high school was at Ben Franklin for me and for my sister, uh, and you had to find your own way to get there. Well, next thing after high school is, what do you do? Well, my parents said, you're going to college. I said, where? Well, I, I don't know. You're <laughs> going to have to find out. Well, uh, I talked to our pastor at Salem Church, uh, Reverend Paul Schroeder, and he suggested to me, well, you know, you ought to look at maybe a UCC-backed church, uh, college. And so he said, why don't you look at Heidelberg? Okay. I knew one person out there, uh, went out for a weekend visit and said, okay, this is fine with me. That was the end of the college search. And where's, where's Heidelberg? It's in the middle of southwest of Cleveland, about 90 miles. Hmm. Uh, it's a good six-hour ride if you don't stop. If you do stop, it takes a little bit longer. But it's, it's a very small college. As we jokingly said, it was a small Christian college for small Christians. And I fit the category <laughs> of being a small Christian. So, um, and... While out there, I, I started as a business major, and after a semester of business courses, I said, that's not for me. And I changed my major to secondary education. And that was it. I had some excellent uh, professors who also became role models uh, for me in terms of what I did once I got into the classroom. I had one professor, uh, Curtis McDonald, 
who said in the introductory course to teaching, you can be one with the students, but not one of the students. Mm. And that was my mant- mantra, if you will, as I went through the teaching profession, that, okay, these are kids, you're the adult, and uh, let's see if we can make things work for everybody. And so I graduated in, let's see, 1960 uh, from Heidelberg, couldn't get a job, so I did substitute teaching for a year. And a lot of my sub-teaching experience was in special education, Mm. especially in the city. And I was looking, and I got this job vacancy posting from a little town in the Catskills called Washingtonville. And they were looking for a social studies teacher. And so, well, that was my major. That was my background. So I, I... sent a letter off and said, I'd love to come down and talk. And they said, well, the social studies position is filled, but we have a special ed position open, and we note that you've done a lot of work in special ed. So I got on Thrailway's bus and went down to Washingtonville, New York, and uh, interviewed with the board president and the high school principal and uh, by the time the interview was over, I had a job teaching special ed. Hmm. Uh, How far is that from Rochester? Uh, it's about a six-hour ride. Uh, it's 10 miles west of Newburgh, New York. Okay. Uh, down in the uh, Catskills, the Borscht Belt, if you will, uh, Florida, Goshen, Monroe, all those big towns. Yeah. Middletown, uh, Beacon, and... Uh, after a, a couple of months, I said, you know, this isn't my cup of tea, but so I'm going to start looking for history vacancies. And I ended up East Ridge High School, just happened to have an East Ridge, a, a high school history position <laughs> open. And I spent 1962 to 1968 teaching history at East Ridge, and then I went into the vice principalship there. And then uh, had the good fortune of being in the right place at the right time. Uh, The superintendent had left to take a job elsewhere. The uh, acting superintendent needed an acting administrative assistant, and I was on a 10-month position, so I now could work for the summer. The new superintendent came in in September and said, I need somebody that knows what's going on around here. So, would you like to stay in this position? So, I spent my next four years working in the district office as the assistant to the superintendent. Uh, Then the taxpayers group took over, and uh, I didn't believe in what they were doing. So, I said, I'll see you. I I was working as the uh, acting superintendent of schools, but you weren't you weren't actively teaching at this point, no, right? You no, were working at that in point, administrative I was world. now the uh, the acting superintendent. And uh, let me uh, let me do one thing. Sorry to interrupt. I just want to. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So, so I didn't believe in, in what that particular group in the community wanted to do to the schools, and so I said, I can't work for you. Well. Okay, so I left on a Friday in mid-August, and on Saturday, my wife and I and three kids were tent camping in the Adirondacks, and we spent a week there. I We came home, and I said, I guess I better try to find a job. <laughs> so, Imagine that. Yeah, so, so I, got, I got a phone call from Ross Willink, who was the superintendent of schools in Webster. Now, Ross Willink was also the man who hired me in East Arundacoit 11 years before that. And he says, I've got a vice principal that vice principalship that's open here. Would you be interested in working in Webster? And when you don't have a job and somebody offers you <laughs> one, you get a job. And right. so I said, absolutely. And as a result, I spent my next 22 years there. In Webster, I spent 11 as a vice principal in the junior high, and then 
I became a vice principal in the senior high for six years, and then the, my final five years uh, I spent in the district office. And then I retired in 1995, hmm. and I said, oh, retirement's going to be good. I'm going to just take life easy and do what I want. Well, that kind of changed. Uh, in fact, when I, I retired on the 30th of June in 1995, and I said, well, I'm going to build a deck on the back of my house. And I had scheduled the, the delivery of all of the lumber and everything else. My wife says, you can't have it delivered yet. I said, why is that? She says, because I've got a retirement party planned for you. So, <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. So <laughs> we put that off. And then uh, my first four or five months as a retiree, I worked on building a, a very nice deck on the house. And then the phone started to ring. Uh, I got a call from Webster. Could you come out and help out? for three months at one of our elementary schools as the, the helping teacher. And sure. So I went out and I worked at in a K-5 building, my first experience with that, and loved every minute of it. I uh, then retired again in the following September. Uh, East Rochester called, and we're looking for a high school principal to fill in for four to six weeks. Uh, would you like to come over and talk with us? And I sure. So we then uh, went over and talked with Howie Mafuchi, who was the superintendent, and the four to six weeks became four months. And then we retired again, and it, it just snowballed from there, and I had the good fortune of being a, a high school principal, an elementary principal, a K-12 Building administrator, uh, I worked as a principal for a full year, Rochester Christian School. Uh, I fit, was in Avon, Geneseo, uh, Webster, West Durandequite. And this is all while you were retired. This is while I'm retired. <laughs> and and I, I, I jokingly tell people, uh, I've really never retired. I, I haven't worked since this past May. So I uh, had fun. I've been doing it for about 60 years. And wow. love every minute of it. If somebody said, would you do it all over again? Absolutely. And you were, you were happy with, um, with coming out of the actual teaching part of it and going into the administrative part of it? That was... Yeah, that, and because I still met one of my... Uh, downfalls, if you will, or <laughs> up, up, I don't know, upfalls. I do management by walking around. So I, if I'm in an L a building, my time in the office is only whenever it's required. Other than that, I'm out interacting with kids and with staff, and it's it's something that. Well, a couple of anecdotes for you. Uh, recently, filling in in an elementary school, there, I, I, I go like I am right now in coat and tie. Well, the kids aren't accustomed to seeing too many people <laughs> in coat and tie in their buildings. So uh, one, one building I was in and the, the kids, are you Bill Clinton? <laughs> no, no. I, <laughs> another building, same, same building, different time frame. Are you George Bush? <laughs> no. Um, and are you a lawyer? <laughs> are you an or FBI are agent? Are you the president? <laughs> uh, are you the president of the school administrators? And I said, no. <laughs> so, but just the opportunity to interact with kids and staff uh, keeps me going. And uh, some of the best experiences in my education career came in retirement. Mm. Uh a little anecdote again. When I was working in East Rochester, I started midweek in September. I'd been on the job two days, and it was a beautiful Friday afternoon. And right outside my office was the, the tennis courts, and the girls' tennis team was playing against some other school. And I said, well, 
what a perfect excuse to go out and enjoy the fresh air and watch the girls play tennis. And uh, the following Monday, Christine, and I'll not mention her last name, but Christine comes to me as she's coming in at 8 in the morning, and she said, Mr. Akron, I just want to say thank you to you for coming to watch my tennis match. That blew me away. I mean, this you, the, you just don't get a lot of those warm fuzzies. Yeah. Uh, and, that, you know, I've got a, oh, I could put a whole collection of it. I got a lot of warm fuzzies that have come in my years in the, yeah. in the profession and loved every minute of it, Scott. Uh, you know, it's 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 amazing how you, something as innocuous as just going out and watching a tennis game. It's a nice day. Uh, you you don't realize what effect that has on the children that are playing, and yeah. they see the principal coming out and watching the game, and they're like, "Wow, that was really yeah. cool. Yeah, that yeah, made and, a big difference to her." Yeah, and it's just I thought I it's something I should do, right? Uh, but the, the kids just <laughs> it was. Neat. I had another. This was another situation, again, in, in East Rochester, walking around after being on the job for about two weeks. Well, it just so happened the vocal music instructor in East Rochester was also a professional entertainer. And she did a one-woman show frequently at the downstairs cabaret. Hmm. So... I'm walking around and it's Friday afternoon and it's. I stop in because the choir, the show choir was rehearsing, and Cindy Miller says, "Mr. Ackroyd, my kids would like to sing for you." Okay, <laughs> and they sang <clears throat> an upbeat version a cappella of one of the big band numbers, and I says, "Wow." I you know I just sat there and uh, the kids want to sing for me. And it was just something that the warm, fuzzy collection just kept getting bigger yeah. as, as we went through. So, yeah, to get back to your original question, it's, it's interacting with kids and staff and being there when if somebody's having a bad day, uh, you know, just a, a pat on the back as opposed to a kick in the butt. Right. Uh, exactly. Makes a world of difference, whether it's the, the staff or the students. And you, in our in our in passing, I I remember that you mentioned that you were on the board at the RPYO as well. Uh, well, yes, that's <clears throat> part of the when I was filling in or filling in when I was working at Rochester Christian School. I got a call from Marilyn Merrigan, who was the volunteer coordinator for the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra. Now, she wanted to know if I'd like to get involved in the RPO. Now, I take that back about 13 years, Scott, when I was working as a vice principal at Webster High School. The student musical that year was West Side Story. Huh. And they needed four old, ge as I call them, four old geezers to play the adult parts. So I became Doc, the friendly pharmacist. Now that's just a little background so that you know that the male lead in West Side Story was a young lad by the name of Chad Merrigan. And M Marilyn Merrigan was his mother. So that's how, so that's that was connection. that connection. Yeah. And she said, would you like to get involved with fundraising for the RPO? Oh. And so, okay. Now, I'm, I'm getting to the, the tie-in with the youth orchestra because that will come shortly. So uh, my wife and I worked on the 2002 show house. Uh, and then in 2003, I got a call from Marilyn American. Would you like to become involved in a fundraising activity for the Philharmonic Youth Orchestra? Now, I had never even heard the yeah. Youth Orchestra. And so, okay. So, well, your honorary co-chairs for this event are Dawn and Jack Lipson, who were significant 
they're donors of the the museum too. Uh, yes, they are. Sig- they are were and are significant philanthropists. Yeah, I know that so name. I sure. went to the fundraiser took place in a yard out in Webster, Penfield. Uh, and the theme was music in an Asian garden. And this hmm. family happened to have a very large yard that they had turned into an Asian garden. And the yard was big enough for us to put the youth orchestra, which was about 100 young wow. adults, young, talented adults. Yeah. So that was how I even I heard the youth orchestra for the first time. And I said, wow. <laughs> Pinch me. Tell me I'm not you know, yeah. making believe. And so then it was time the following year, because Don and Jack liked what we did with the fundraiser. Uh, would you like to join the Philharmonic Youth Orchestra Board of Directors? In fact, we'd like you to be the chair. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so we ended up with... Uh, chairing the Youth Orchestra Board of Directors for 10 or so years. And uh, that led to uh, me being given the opportunity to to also be on the Philharmonic Board of Directors for nine years and chairing their education committee. There's a surprise, right? Yeah. (laughs) So, So chairing the education committee and chairing the youth orchestra went hand in hand. And then uh, I had, after nine years on the Philharmonic Board, I had to step down because the bylaws said you can have three three-year terms, and then you're done. Yeah. So I, I did that. We uh, had a lot of fun working with the youth orchestra and with the, the big orchestra and uh, developed friendships. Uh, so, that, yeah, that's how I got involved with the youth orchestra. And... I just was amazed at the talent of these kids. And, oh, yeah, uh, it's incredible. And the support that they received from their parents as well, because this was quite a, you know, there's a significant time uh, factor yeah. here. There's also a significant financial consideration. So anything we could do to raise funds for the youth orchestra was certainly money well spent, time well spent. So I'm trying to think... When you were in Webster, when you were when you were at the high school, were you at Webster Thomas High School? Well, when I I was at the Schrader Building, which was a seven twelve building until nineteen eighty four, and that's when they combined the junior highs, the two junior highs into one, and the two senior highs into one. And then they just had to decide who gonna who's going to go to which building as as administrators, and the decision was made that I would go to the high school. On okay, so I'm just trying to think. So my 1984 to 1990, I was at Thomas. Okay. All right. So then, and my my wife graduated from Thomas in '92. All right. She would have been. There, she would have been there when you were vice president, right? And uh, vi- I, vice principal, right? And then I, I moved into the district office in 1990, so I would not have had any direct, uh, unless she managed to get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> she could have been. She was a troublemaker back then. So you, so you moved to the district office in 1990, right? All right. So she would have been, she would have been at least uh, a freshman in your last year, most likely. Either freshman or sophomore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, that's interesting. So it's just another example of the the small world that we live here, live in here in Rochester, and and you know, I mean, overall, the world is small when it comes down to human connection and, and things like that. It's amazing how many how people you don't even realize. Like, I could probably, I'll probably, you know what, I'll do when I when I go home today. I'm going to go back and she still has all her yearbooks. I'm going to go back to the yearbook. I'm going to find you. And I'm going to take a picture of it. Yeah. It's so funny. It's so funny. So so then when did you wrap up with the, the RPO and the RPYO? Uh, let's see. Around 2013 or 2014 Okay, uh, was the end of my onboard uh, experiences, but we still, my wife and I still 
uh, are supporters of the Philharmonic and the Youth Orchestra, and uh, we still are subscribers. And uh, we just, you know, realize these are world-class musicians, mm. uh, and we're so fortunate to have them in Rochester. Uh, and I, I take it back to when I was filling in at Rochester Christian School. We had some very good musicians that would come in to work with the kids. Kenny Grant, who's the principal clarinet, would come in and work with their 7th and 8th grade woodwind players. And then he'd be out in the hall with his clarinet playing the Three Stooges theme. So, <laughs> And we also had Wes Nance and his wife Shannon. Wes is a tr- plays second trumpet in the uh, RPO. He would come in and work with the brass section. Uh, the band director found out that I <laughs> played a trumpet a few years before and said, Oh, well, here's some music. We need you to help out in the brass section. Uh, Go home and, you know, (laughs) learn the music and then come on to rehearsal. So before I – the mistake I made, Scott, was I had a necktie on with trumpets on it. (laughs) And she said, do you play a trumpet? And so I sat in and I played in the Lilac Festival with the Rochester Christian 7th and 8th grade band. And I was sitting there and I – Wes Nance is is also there. Uh, I don't think Kenny Grant was playing with them at this time, but yeah, it it, it was as you say a small world, and uh, so I got to sit and play <laughs> coronet with the a, a Philharmonic trumpet player. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So what, go ahead. what would you what would you say to um, to young people today who are looking to you know start a career in education? What what piece of advice would you give them? Yeah, that that's that's a good question. I I think one they have to be able to listen and. You know, go back to that mantra that I was given as an undergraduate student. You can be one with, but not one of the students. So that you don't get into the trap of trying to be everybody's friend. You mm. can't be. Yeah. You have a job to do, and but you still have to be a person. Uh, I, I think of one of my colleagues who's uh, long since deceased, when somebody used the phrase losers for kids. Uh. And he said, no. He said, we have kids who suffer losses, but we don't have any losers. And that's, you know, you, you if you're not interested in spending time and working with kids one-on-one as well as large group settings, then education is not for you. Uh, you're not going to get rich, although the pay scale is significantly better than it was when I started. Uh, my kids still marvel at the fact that my first teaching experience was 4800 a year. Got paid <laughs> once a month. Oh, wow. So you got $400 a month. Well, yeah. divide that by four weeks, that's 100 and that's before taxes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, Think seriously if you want to go into education and think about the teachers you had. And if you can identify one or two of them that really stood out in your education, what was it that was you liked about them? Why did they stand out in what, what you do? Uh, and you can find people who did not uh, stand out mm-hmm. in your education – well, what was it about them that didn't strike a responsive chord with you? And look to find the best that you can find in all of the people that worked with you in a K-12 setting. What were the assets they brought? Use that as a guideline to say, okay, I think I can do it. Or I, don't, I can't do it. Start, get, and if you start out and you're not happy in doing it, then don't do it. Yeah. Uh, Because an unhappy staff member is no good to the kids or anybody else. 
My favorite teachers throughout all of my school career were always the ones with the passion. They were the ones that loved what they did. They loved being there. They loved working with us. They loved the subject matter. They made the subject matter fun. Those yeah. were the ones that, that really made a difference in, in my life. And I'm sure that's kind of a, that's probably universal. I mean, you're going to have a better experience when you go to class and the teacher's like, makes it fun and interesting and, and engaging rather than the one that's like, page two, yeah, you know, right. and boring. <laughs> Let, another anecdote to share with you. Uh, my wife and I went out to celebrate a wedding anniversary. I think it was a wedding anniversary. It was one of those big numbers. Yeah. You know, we've been around a while. <laughs> so we went out to Warfields in Clifton Springs. And we got ourselves a nice booth. Didn't have reservations, but we they gave us a nice booth. And we're sitting there. And golly, there's a table of four kitty corner from where we were. And all of a sudden... The one young, well, younger woman gets up and comes over and says, Are you Dave Ackroyd? I said, Yeah. Well, I'm so and so. You taught me in 1968. Oh, my goodness. And she says, I just want, had to come over and say hello. She says, But I, she says, I need to tell you about an incident when you were teaching that. You did at the start of class one one semester. I had, had been taking grad courses at SUNY Brockport, and the professor said, you ever think of taping a piece of paper over the big clock so that kids can't tell what time it is? So I said, gee, I'm going to do that. <laughs> so I got to school early, and I just covered up the face of the clock so kids couldn't tell what time it was. And uh, she says, we came, I came into your class, and I saw that, and she said, oh, we're going to have fun in here. And that's what we did. We had a lot of fun. We learned as well, but we had fun doing it. But that stuck out in her mind that somebody would tape something. I mean, yeah. And yet even <laughs> we went through the 40-minute class, and the kids still knew when it was time to get up and go. Even sure. Without, <laughs> sure. They were so, they enjoyed doing that. I had fun doing that. Uh, and we, we would bring, I brought in a tape of a radio show. Uh, this was, it was on, w, I think it was WHEC. They had a thing called the Joe Pine Show. And he took exception with some of the wackos that were out there on radio and uh, I liked what the program was, and I said, so I got a hold of the station, and I said, can I get a copy of that tape? And so, sure, just send us, uh, send us a, a, a replacement tape, and we'll put it on yeah. <laughs> tape. Send us a you. blank tape, wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it was about a seven-inch tape, so, uh, and we played that for the kids, and they said, how can anybody like that be on the radio? Well... <laughs> To look at what's on the radio today. <laughs> so, but, yeah, so just fun times. Yeah. Uh, uh, my wife and I chaperoned the senior choir on a trip to the New York World's Fair, uh, <clears throat> 1964, I believe. And then we also chaperoned the choir trip to Washington, D.C. And... Uh, had a lot of fun doing that. We we chaperoned dances all the time when we I was teaching at Eastridge. We danced. <laughs> the kids got the biggest kick out of these two old fogies dancing uh, at at in the gymnasium. Of course, that's when you won't you you probably when you had the senior ball and so forth. You went to some fancy place in right the, yeah well not the gym no nah, well that's where we had our senior ball and yeah. they had they had wires that they would stretch across the gym ceiling to bring down the ceiling and then they would drape fabric so it looked somewhat better than then yeah <laughs> so 
But yeah, so the good old days really were. We we just had a good time teaching. What else can I tell you on these positive blatherings? Well, I you know, as we wrap up because we're getting close to time here, but I it's interesting because I did not I didn't know what you did. I didn't know what your your career was. I had no idea, but now it all makes sense. Yeah, well, now it all makes sense. Um I, I'm I'm grateful to be able to sit down and talk with you about this and, and learn about how you know, education how you, you moved through the education system and, and I, I think it's interesting that you went all the way to the Catskills to come right back when how long were you out there? Like ten months you said? I was there for one one, oh, for one, one year. One yeah. school year. I started in September and uh, <laughs> in order to keep the job I had to take special education classes at New York University. So twice a week you went I into would the city. drive into New York City. I'd leave about one in the afternoon on Wednesdays to get down to New York University in Washington Square, right wow. in Greenwich Village. Get right there. in the epicenter of all the oh, all the stuff. It was And this was in the sixties? This was September of nineteen sixty one. Wow. Yeah. Park your car and get a cup of coffee, a chock full of nuts. And <laughs> uh, but you know, the Greenwich Village, the Washington Square Park. I mean, you'd go there and you'd find the older gentlemen playing chess on the chess tables, the yeah, concrete with the chess timers, tables, the waiting uh, pool where mamas and their little ones would be in there. Uh, yeah, I, I took it Wednesday mornings and se- or Wednesday evenings and Saturday mornings, and uh, I was not fond of driving in the New York City area. No, uh, I did. Just coming from West Rochester, Side that's Drive like and Henry Hudson Parkway. I and then you go from that, and then all of a sudden you come to Bear Mountain State Park, and you got to watch out for you know the huge her- herds of deer. So <laughs> it, uh, but yeah, yeah, so. The uh, the opportunity was there. The uh, I found that I was not cut out to teach special ed, but that's what you look. I, I found out, and I found my calling in uh, teaching history, and more importantly, teaching kids. Yeah. Well, th- thank you for everything that you've done in your career, and for the and obviously, you know, just by the people that have, like like the student, the former student that that talked to you when you were out with your wife, you know, those, those moments when someone says, wow, you did this one thing that you probably forgot about at the time that they said, wow, that made a huge difference to me. So that really, yeah. you know, is what it's all about. And that's those warm fuzzies yeah. just keep you going. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great note to end on Dave Ackroyd. Thank you so much for joining us on the blather. And thank Appreciate you for it. giving me the opportunity. Thank you.